as a pediatric research section. And this, is, this could be a, a great begin of a part, one partnership for us and discuss more cases and do more virtual and events probably in the future. So I'd like to invite Benny Iskandar to, to begin his lecture. Thank you, Benny, to come. Thank you both, Ricardo. Uh, this is it's a true pleasure to to do this. And you know, last week it seems that Brazil hit a million cases of coronavirus infections, and and it seems like your country suffers from similar political and unrest to ours. So I, our thoughts are with you, and we hope the world will know how to heal from all these difficulties uh, soon. Uh, the best way to achieve this for us is to pull together and communicate. So I'd like to thank my great old friend uh, and, you, and your next president, Ricardo uh, de Gep, for starting this process, inviting me to give this presentation. Um, the, let me share my screen. Uh, so, by the way, uh, Ricardo, I need pictures of your family because the ones I had, Caterina was a baby and Roberto was reading dinosaur books. So uh, I, I'll wait for the pictures. Um, you know, we've inherited a lot of dogma and methodologies uh, from our predecessors, from our teachers, and many shunt problems. When I started my practice, I felt that part of my responsibility, of course, was to pr provide care uh, for people, for children. But then I felt that another part of my responsibility is to improve care. We all are responsible to improving care because as it stands, the care is really not good enough. So this morning, I hope you don't mind that I'm, I'm sharing a personal journey for you rather than trying to review an exhaustive topic, which is something you can read in textbooks. So I, uh, I thought that I would tell you about what we have tried to do over the years in light of the problems that we see with shunts. I don't have to tell this audience about what hydrocephalus means in the world. Uh, it's extremely common, way more common than Down syndrome, whereas Down syndrome is funded much better than hydrocephalus by the NIH, for example. It's the leading cause of pediatric neurosurgery cases in the US and the leading cause of morbidity and mor mortality among brain surgery in children. Uh, when, when the shunt was introduced in the 1940s and 1950s, the goal was to increase life expectancy. These children used to die. But over the past 60 years, really the goal has been to improve quality of care. This is John Holter, his wife and child. Uh, his child has spina bifida and hydrocephalus. He was very sick. So uh, Holter, who was a machinist, uh, like an engineer, asked his, uh, uh, his son's surgeon what he's going to do for his son. And his surgeon said, sorry, I, there is nothing that I can do. Uh, we don't have a way to shunt fluid out of the brain and keep it controlled. So uh, John Holter decided to take it into his own hands. Uh, he went to his garage and started trying things. And then this resulted in a valve that he made out of silicone rubber, which had never been implanted into people before. Prior to that, silicone was only used on planes. Before 1958, when the, this valve was introduced, 9% of children with hydrocephalus survived till age 10, and all survivors were cognitively delayed. After 1958, the vast majority survived long term, and more than half of them were, had normal intellect. The problem is that some children still die. So we decided to look at that. And I'll give you a couple of examples. I'm sure many of you have seen those types of examples. 16 year old who was shunted at birth, never had a shunt problem, 
when she presented with headaches, they assumed that since the shunt has been, uh, that, that she's been doing well for 16 years, that the shunt may not be needed. So there was a three day delay in her care. On the third day when she came to the hospital, she died on, ar on, on arrival. So the question is, who's at fault here? Is it the family that didn't bring the patient uh, early enough to the, to, 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 to the hospital? Is it the family physician who, who didn't insist to send the patient to the hospital? Is it the neurosurgeon that didn't give them enough education and encouragement to call when a problem such as this arises? This is a nine-year-old girl. This was my second month in Madison uh, after my fellowship. And um, she came into the emergency room with headaches and vomiting. When she was on the CAT scan, she blew her pupils. The, lucky that she did it on the CAT scan because that's right around the corner from the operating room. We rushed her to the operating room, revised her shunt, and this is her many years later. She now around the world. She was lucky. Had her pupils car drank to the hospital, she wouldn't have survived. This is a young man who died in the hospital. He was, a, he was 20 years old palsy. He was nonverbal and had just had a shunt revision. He started having seizures. And when the resident and the nurse looked in the chart, they said, well, he has a history of seizures. Therefore, seizures for him are normal. He was shouting obscenities. And then in retrospect, his mother, who was working at the time, she had to work nights, told us that when her son shouts obscenities, something is terribly wrong. He must be in pain. He died three hours later. So the question is, how do we assess patients with an abnormal baseline? What does it mean to have a history of seizures? And you have to listen to the parents. When we see a child who is developmentally significantly delayed, how do we know that he's worse if we don't know his baseline really well? Um, and this is a child who came into the hospital uh, and we had never seen her before. And uh, we did not think the, sh the shunt was, was not working. My resident thought that the shunt was fine from a shunt tap, but we decided to admit her for observation. There were no beds in the hospital. She was transferred to another institution under another neurosurgeon and died two hours after arrival. So that was a system failure. And we learned a lesson then, and there's no patient now that comes to our hospital that uh, with, with hydrocephalus, with a shunt, who gets transferred elsewhere, even if we have to put them in the hallway. So we looked at that uh, and we looked specifically at patients who died of shunt malfunction. And there were 28 children. This is right before I came to Madison. I looked at the county records and found that there were 28 children that died of hydrocephalus in a six year period. And the immediate cause of death was something related to their shunt. And then I went back to their health records and said, well, could we have predicted this? And what we found is that a third of the patients had symptoms of increased intracranial pressure for, uh, for up to four weeks before they presented. 50% of them had, patient, had symptoms for one to four days, the other 50% one to four weeks. And some of them were lost to follow-up, which means that had we gotten to this patient uh, earlier, maybe we would have saved their lives. Six years later, the same group, we looked at the numbers again, and we found that instead of 28 patients, only four patients died in this six year period. And the question is why? What is it that saved these kids' lives? Well, what we found is that it wasn't technical and it wasn't unpreventable 
you know, death. It was all related to education because the, what changed in that period of time between the first six years and the second six years is we set up or, or the group set up an office of nurses who are on the phone, who are talking to patients, who are taking their phone calls, who are educating these families in order to make sure that they all understand what hydrocephalus is, what shunt malfunction looks like, that they can call us anytime, day or night. And this is what improved the care, this is what prevented these deaths. Which was why we have clinics and multidisciplinary clinics. We do routine outpatient follow-up at least yearly uh, with some surveillance imaging. We uh, try to understand the complicating factors of each patient. We make sure that there's enough communication of the family that they feel comfortable calling us. Uh, we enhance family comfort. We empower the nurse practitioners to make decisions, to bring patients to the emergency room if they need to. And we educate them. We need to tell them about endoscopic third ventriculostomies, about not to wait overnight with a headache. You need to call right away. We communicate with the caregiver. So what really improves care is education. And that's the first lesson I learned. The second problem that we, what we found with caring with kids for shunts is that sometimes the CAT scan or MRI scan shows change in bed size when shunt fails. This is a 10 year old boy who came in with symptoms of shunt malfunction. His scan was normal. We did an intracranial pressure monitor was over 50 millimeters of mercury. The shunt did well, but still his cat's scan. This is a emergency scene. looks fine. now you can hello uh, yes we can hear you okay yeah somehow uh, it interrupted so I had to sign back in uh, so this is all day the emergency room and the junior resident that saw diagnosed them and did not think that the shunt was working that uh, was not working uh, she sent home and said that he's have Uh, Ricardo, I think that it's uh, the internet of uh, Benny that is. Uh, yes. Have some problem. Yeah. I'm typing for him. Yeah. 